Welcome to The Wide Angle, I'm Brendan Fallon. Top Gun Maverick is breaking box office records. Meanwhile, Canadian pilots deployed in Japan recently had a dose of some quasi Top Gun action. On June 1st, Canadian aircrew had to quickly modify their flight paths to avoid collision with intercepting Chinese Communist Party or CCP military jets, said Canada's Department of National Defence. The Canadians were there as part of the international effort to back United Nations sanctions against North Korea. What they didn't count on was Chinese regime fighter jets playing chicken with them and then giving them the bird. Yes, Global News' sources said Chinese jets flew so close that Canadian pilots could make eye contact with them, with Chinese pilots sometimes raising their middle fingers. Now, this isn't the first recent CCP military provocation of the West. It wasn't that long ago Australia accused the Chinese Navy of pointing a military-grade laser at one of its military planes. And who can forget the surprise send-off Russian and Chinese warplanes gave Joe Biden as he wrapped up his Asia trip in May. Anyway, flipping the bird and playing chicken in the air is one thing, but the CCP's fighter pilots may want to be careful about biting off more than they can chew. Here's the reason. Canada's Air Force has seen its share of combat over recent decades. Iraq, Yugoslavia in the 90s, Afghanistan in the 2000s, whereas China's military, not so much. It's been around 40 years since the Chinese regime military has seen active combat. What's more, in 2017, the so-called People's Liberation Army, or PLA, let slip a range of bizarre reasons why its soldiers were failing fitness tests. Although this document doesn't seem to exist anymore, perhaps for reasons of national embarrassment. Allegedly, however, it reported 8% of men had, quote, enlarged veins in their scrotum. Too much sitting down and video game playing were both identified causes of this. In mid-2020, PLA soldiers reportedly came off second best when they ambushed Indian soldiers in Ladakh. Indian veterans alleged PLA troops attacked Indian soldiers with crude medieval-style weapons when the Indians were unarmed. Such barbarism must be condemned. This is thuggery, not soldiering, said a retired Indian Army colonel, who shared an image of the weapons used. In any event, the PLA allegedly had its ass kicked, losing twice as many soldiers as the Indian side. The PLA actually is not an army like nations have, commented one of India's retired top brass. They don't appreciate the way combat troops operate because the PLA is a political party's army. So flipping the bird to Canadians and staging scary exercises near Taiwan airspace is one thing, but the PLA would come off worse to wear in a real combat situation. And besides, Canadians have enough problems. They have Justin Trudeau for a prime minister. Today we look at how the CCP factors into the phenomenal success of Top Gun Maverick. Before that, I ask Elliot Ackerman what would happen if China did invade Taiwan and America intervened. Elliot served five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan as a U.S. Marine Corps officer. He's the author of New York Times bestseller 2034, a novel of the next world war. If China invaded Taiwan tomorrow and, and the U.S. did intervene, how would that play out, do you think? I think it's interesting because the let's say Ukraine had gone differently and we had seen a very weak response from NATO, and we'd seen very fractious and minimal Ukrainian resistance, I think the, the immediately follow-up question would be, okay, what are the implications for China making a move on Taiwan? And I think one of the, you know, there are many challenges that have occurred, that are occurring in Ukraine right now, uh, as we already talked about, you know, that war uh, could be grinding to a stalemate. But all of that being said, the one, I think, glimmer of light in this is, is it's shown that the free people of the world are very much willing to unite in a block to stand up to authoritarian regimes. And that reduces the likelihood that the CCP would necessarily make a move on Taiwan, or at least it's less likely now than it would have been if things in Ukraine had gone much worse. And what would happen it would, if there was an over-military move against Taiwan? Uh, yeah, I think you would see, you know, I think you would see the U.S. intervene along with our allies uh, in the Pacific. Uh, and I think it would be a very costly and horrible war. Uh, and, the, you know, the spirit with which uh, I wrote 2034 along with Admiral uh, Stavridis, the former NATO commander, um, was, you know, we need to imagine how horrible this would be so that it never happens. Um, because if we look back at the Cold War, when the dynamic was uh, you know, the U.S. versus the Soviet Union, 
mean, that was a time when both sides could agree on very, very little. But the one thing we could agree upon was that nobody wanted to fight that third nuclear world war because everybody would lose. And we haven't done that same imaginative work with regards to a conflict between the CCP and Western democracies and our, and our partners in the Pacific. Um, but we need to do that work uh, as a way to avoid such a conflict. Uh, drawing again from the Russia-Ukraine example, is there something we, that the, the U.S. could learn from that and, and apply to a future, to staving off a, a future warfare situation with China? Sure, I think the, the U.S. should be, um, should be investing in the infrastructure that it would need to prosecute any type of conflict in the Pacific. We should be re reinforcing our relationships with our allies. We should be continuing to arm and perhaps more aggressively arm uh, the Taiwanese so they can protect themselves. Uh, and that really the greatest deterrent is strength, strength in the region, strength of the Taiwanese, and sending very clear signals that any threat to Taiwan will be, will be answered and not being quite as ambiguous as we've been about it in the past. And just lastly, Elliot, in, in terms of that question, I'm interested to know as a, as a former Marine captain, what role you see for the Marine Corps in those preparations and also if worst came to worst and that scenario did manifest? The Marine Corps as a service fills a somewhat unique niche in U.S. military structures uh, in so much uh, you know, it's a service that comes from the sea, obviously, but it's also one where historically there's been a lot of innovation. The Marine Corps is the smallest service. It can innovate the most quickly. And frequently, um, you know, the, the Marine Corps you have today uh, is what the Army of Tomorrow winds up looking like. And so there is a debate, and we're seeing it in Ukraine right now, as to what the U.S. military and really all military should look like in the future, whether or not our historic reliance on very expensive, exquisite platforms uh, like Ford-class aircraft carriers or F-35 strike fighters is where our emphasis should be, or whether or not it should be on uh, you know, lower-cost anti-platform capabilities like Javelin missiles, Neptune missiles, or even Stinger missiles, even though it's a very old-generation missile, but the ability to destroy those platforms. It's uh, like a large platform, like an aircraft carrier versus just troops on the ground being able to to exercise this capability on the, themselves with a obviously with a much lower lower cost and um, a much simpler kind of um, execution. Yes, it's a, a system like a, a Javelin anti-tank missile that we've seen deployed so effectively in Ukraine or you know Stingers even though they're a 1980s technology but those are anti-air missiles that have been deployed to great success. So you know, this question of which one necessarily has the upper hand, the platforms or the anti-platform capability. And going forward, what should we be building our strategies around? Should we be building them around platforms, around these anti-platform teams that can move quickly, or should it be a blend of both? And I don't know if there's an answer yet, but you know, these are the types of debates that are going on uh, vigorously right now. They're going on inside the Marine Corps right now. You know, I would wager most people probably aren't paying that much attention because maybe it feels like it's a little inside baseball. But mm. the outcome of those debates could very well determine who has the upper hand in the next war, whenever that would come.